Welcome to 2024 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Welcome to lesson number one from the series of Sabbath School lessons on the Psalms titled How to Read the Psalms, ready for teaching on January 6, authored by Dr. Dragoslava Santrak and read by Percy Harold. We begin by having the author, Dr. Dragoslava Santrak, read the introduction to the whole quarter's lessons on pages four and five of the lesson quarterly. Welcome, Dr. Dragoslava. The Psalms, where God and people meet heart to heart. The Psalms are prayers and hymns of the Bible par excellence, uttered in praise, joy, sorrow, and despair, spoken or sung in private and in the public by lay people, kings, poets, and priests. Coming from both the righteous and repentant sinners, the Psalms have served as the prayer book and the hymn book to generations of believers. The book of Psalms owes its distinct role to the fact that while most of the Bible speaks to us, the Psalms speak for us and with us. The Psalms are a source of blessing, hope, and revival, and guide for both self-reflection and reflection on God's greatness liberating when one cries out of the depths and captivating for a renewed surrender to God. It is thus not surprising that many people find the Psalms resonating with their emotions and experiences and adopt them as their own prayers. Luther poignantly speaks of the Psalms. I quote, Where can one find nobler words to express joy than in the psalms of praise or gratitude? In them you can see into the hearts of all the saints as if you were looking at a lovely pleasure garden or were gazing into heaven. Or where can one find more profound, more penitent, more sorrowful words in which to express grief than in the Psalms of Lamentations. In these, you see into the hearts of all the saints as if you were looking at death or gazing into hell, so dark and obscure is the scene rendered by the changing shadows of the wrath of God. It is therefore easy to understand why the book of Psalms is the favorite book of all the saints, for every man, on every occasion, can find in it psalms which fit his needs, which he feels to be appropriate as if they had been set there just for his sake. In no other book can he find words to equal them, nor better words. End of quote. Martin Luther, Selections from His Writings Editor, John Dillenberger, New York, Anchor Books, 1962, pages 39 and 40. To experience the life-transforming power of the Psalms, we are called to sing and pray them, as did the generations of believers who have used the Psalms to pour out their praises, petitions, confessions, laments, and thanksgiving to the sovereign God of grace and justice. Do we need to study the Psalms then? Like the rest of the scriptures, the Psalms were written in their distinctive historical, theological, and literary contexts. The task of the study of the Psalms is to bring the particular world of the Psalms closer to the modern audience. We must note that while the Psalms are prayers of God's people, and even prayers that Jesus prayed as the incarnated Lord, the Psalms are also prayers about Jesus. They are God's revelation to humanity. Another task of the study of the Psalms is thus to learn from the Psalms about all that God did, does, and will do for the world in and through Jesus Christ. 
Although the Psalms are a collection of 150 poems, the collection may not be as random as it appears. The Psalms bear witness to a spiritual journey that is common to many of God's children. The journey begins with a faith that is firmly established and secured by God's sovereign rule and where good gets rewarded and evil punished. As we progress through our study, we will see what happens when the well-ordered world of faith is challenged and threatened by evil. Does God still reign? How can believers sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Our desire and prayer are that the Psalms strengthen us on our life journey and that through them we get to meet God daily, heart to heart, until the day when we see Jesus Christ face to face. My name is Dragoslava Centrak. I have a PhD in Old Testament and a managing editor of the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists at the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventist World Headquarters. I have authored the volume on the Psalms 76 to 150 for the Seventh-day Adventist International Bible Commentary. Sabbath afternoon, December 30. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new exciting series of lessons on the book of Psalms, written by Dr. Dragoslava. And Lord, we thank you for what she has written, because this is a very important part of your scripture, and it's also part of her life work to study what is written in the Psalms. Lord, each of us needs to know what is there, because we find comfort there, we find hope there, we find history, and Lord, we find the knowledge that comes that you are the God who cares for each of us. And before we start today, I pray that as we open your word, your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us. And today I'd also like to pray for people such as Bob Breeze and Jennifer Robinson and her family in Maryland, for Marcia Ford and Margaret Campbell, for Dinah, for Sybil Horton and her family and her church and her friend Doshanbe in Jamaica, and Emma Hernandez and Christy Jones of Trinidad and her family too, Lord. You know their needs. And Jimmy Stoner as well. Lord, we pray that each of us, doesn't matter where we are listening in the world, may be blessed because you were there with us as we open your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Luke chapter 24, verses 44 and 45. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Let's read that again. Luke 24 verses 44 and 45. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. The Psalms have been a prayer book and hymn book for both Jews and Christians through the ages. And though the Psalms are predominantly the psalmist's own words addressed to God, the Psalms did not originate with mortals, but with God, who inspired their thoughts. Indeed, the Lord inspired them to write what they did, which is why, as in all of Scripture, as we read in 2 Peter 1.21, God in the Psalms speaks to us through his servants and by his spirit. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 21 reads, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Jesus, 
The apostles and the writers of the New Testament cited the Psalms and referred to them as Scripture, as we'll read shortly in Mark 12.10, John 10.34 and 35, and John 13 verse 18. They are as surely the Word of God as are the books of Genesis and Romans. So first of all, we look at Mark chapter 12 and verse 10. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And John 10 verses 34 and 35, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods. If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. And John 13, verse 18. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. The Psalms have been written in Hebrew poetry by different authors from ancient Israel, and so the Psalms reflect their particular world, however universal their messages. Accepting the Psalms as God's Word and paying close attention to the Psalms' poetic features, as well as their historical, theological and liturgical contexts, is fundamental for understanding their messages, which reach across thousands of years to our time today. Sunday, December 31, the Psalms in Ancient Israel's Worship. Read 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 7, Nehemiah 12, verse 8, Psalm 18, verse 1, Psalm 30, verse 1, Psalm 92, verse 1, Psalm 95, verse 2, Psalm 105, verse 2, Colossians 3, 16, and James 5, 13. What were the occasions that prompted the writings of some psalms? When did God's people use the psalms? First of all, 1 Chronicles 16, verse 7. On that day, David first delivered this psalm into the hand of Asaph and his brethren to thank the Lord. And Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 8. Moreover, the Levites were Jeshua, Binua, Kadmiel, Sherebiah, Judah, and Mataniah, who led the thanksgiving psalms, he and his brethren. And Psalm 18, verse 1. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. And Psalm 30, verse 1, a psalm, a song at the dedication of the house of David. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. And Psalm 92, verse 1, a psalm, a song for the Sabbath day. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. And Psalm 95, verse 2, Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. And Psalm 105, verse 2, Sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of all his wondrous works. And Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And James 5 verse 13, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. What were the occasions that prompted the writing of these psalms? When did God's people use the psalms? The psalms were composed for use in private and in communal worship. They were sung as hymns in temple worship, as suggested by the musical annotations that mention instruments in Psalm 61, verse 1, tunes in Psalm 9, verse 1, and music leaders in Psalm 8, and verse 1. 
And so we read from Psalm 61 verse 1 to the chief musician on a stringed instrument, a psalm of David, Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. And Psalm 9 verse 1 to the chief musician to the tune of Death of the Son, a psalm of David. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvellous works. And Psalm 8 and verse 1 to the chief musician on the instrument of Gath, a psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. In the Hebrew Bible, the title of the book of Psalms, Tehillim, T-E-H-I-L-I-M, or praises, reflects its main purpose, that is, the praise of God. The English title, Book of Psalms, is derived from the Greek Psalmoi, P-S-A-L-M-O-I, found in the Septuagint and early 2nd and 3rd century BC, Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. The Psalms were an indispensable part of Israel's worship. For example, they were used in temple dedications, religious feasts and processions, as well as during the setting down of the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem. The Song of Ascents, that's Psalms 120 through to Psalms 134, also known as the Pilgrimage Songs, were traditionally sung during the pilgrimage to Jerusalem at the three major annual festivals, as described in Exodus 23 verses 14 to 17. Three times you shall keep a feast for me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib, for in it you shall come out of Egypt, none shall appear before me empty. And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labours which you have sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering at the end of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labours from the field. Three times in the year all your male shall appear before the Lord God." The Egyptian Hallel, Psalms 113 to 118, and the Great Hallel, Psalm 136, was sung at the three major annual festivals, including the festivals of the new moon and the dedication of the temple. The Egyptian Hallel received a significant place in the Passover ceremony. Psalms 113 and 114 were sung at the beginning of the Passover meal, and Psalms 115 to 118 at the end, as we read in Matthew 26, verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The daily Hillel of Psalms 145 to 150 was incorporated into the daily prayers in the synagogue morning services. The Psalms did not only accompany the people's worship, but they also instructed them on how they should worship God in the sanctuary. Jesus prayed with the words of Psalm 22 in Matthew 27 and verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Psalms found a significant place in the life of the early church as well. As you read in Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts, to the Lord. And Ephesians 5 verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And so to finish the day, though we of course do not worship God in an earthly sanctuary like the temple, how can we use the psalms in our own worship, whether in a private or in a corporate setting? Monday, January 1. Meet the Psalmists.
King David, whose name appears in the titles of most psalms, was active in organising the liturgy of Israel's worship. He is called the sweetest psalmist of Israel in 2 Samuel 23, verse 1. The whole text reads, Now these are the last words of David. Thus says David, the son of Jesse, thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. The New Testament attests a Davidic authorship of various psalms, as we read in Matthew chapter 22, verses 43 to 45. He said to them, How then does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And Acts chapter 2, verses 28 to 29, For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And verses 34 and 35, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And Acts chapter 4, verse 25, Who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why do the nations rage and the people plot vain things? And Romans chapter 4, verses 6 to 8, Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Numerous psalms were composed by the temple musicians who were also Levites. For example, Psalm 50 and Psalm 73 to 83 by Asaph, Psalm 42, Psalms 44 to 47, Psalm 49, Psalm 84, Psalm 85 and Psalm 88 by the sons of Korah, Psalm 88 by Heman the Ezrahite, and Psalm 89 by Ethan the Ezrahite. Beyond them, Solomon, Psalm 72, Psalm 127, and Moses, Psalm 90, authored some psalms. Read Psalm 25, 1 to 5, Psalm 42, 1, Psalm 75, 1, Psalm 77, 1, Psalm 84, 1 and 2, Psalm 88, 1 to 3, and Psalm 89, verse 1. What do these psalms reveal about the experiences their authors were going through? First of all, Psalm 25, verses 1 to 5. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. And Psalm 42, verse 1. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. And Psalm 75, verse 1. We give thanks to you, O God, we give thanks. For your wondrous works declare that your name is near. And Psalm 77, verse 1, I cried out to God with my voice, to God with my voice, and he gave ear to me. Psalm 84, verses 1 and 2, How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. 
and Psalm 88, verses 1 to 3. O Lord, God of my salvation, I have cried out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry, for my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to the grave. And then Psalm 89, verse 1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. What do these psalms reveal about the experiences their authors were going through? The Holy Spirit inspired the psalmists and used their talents in service to God and to their community of faith. The psalmists were people of genuine devotion and profound faith, and yet prone to discouragements and temptations, as are the rest of us. Though written a long time ago, the Psalms surely reflect some of what we experience today. Psalm 88 verses 2 and 3 read, Let my prayer come before you, incline your ear to my cry, for my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to the grave. This is a cry of the 21st century soul as much as it was of someone 3,000 years ago. Some psalms mention hardships, some focus on joys. The psalmists cried out to God to save them and experienced his undeserved favour. They glorified God for his faithfulness and love and they pledged their untiring devotion to him. The Psalms are thus testimonies of divine redemption and signs of God's grace and hope. The Psalms convey a divine promise to all who embrace by faith God's gifts of forgiveness and of a new life. Yet, at the same time, they do not try to cover up, hide or downplay the hardships and suffering prevalent in a fallen world. And so, to finish today... How can we draw hope and comfort knowing that even faithful people, such as the psalmists, struggled with some of the same things that we do? Tuesday, January 2, a song for every season. Read Psalm 3. Psalm 33, verses 1 to 3, and Psalm 109, verses 6 to 15. What different facets of human experience do these psalms convey? First of all, Psalm 3, beginning at verse 1. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say to me, There is no help for him in God. Selah. For you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill, Selah. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessings are upon your people. Salah. And Psalm 33, beginning at verse 1. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make melody for him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. And Psalm 109, verses 6 to 15. Set a wicked man over him, and let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is judged, he will be found guilty, and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless, and his wife a widow. Let his children continually be vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also from their desolate places. Let the creditor seize all that he has, and let strangers plunder his labour. 
let there be none to extend mercy to him, nor let there be any to favour his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be continually before the Lord, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. The Psalms make the believing community aware of the full range of human experience, and they demonstrate that believers can worship God in every season in life. In them we see the following. 1. Hymns that magnify God for His majesty and power in creation, His kingly rule, judgment and faithfulness. 2. Thanksgiving psalms that express profound gratitude for God's abundant blessings. 3. Laments that are heartfelt cries to God for deliverance from trouble. 4. Wisdom psalms that provide practical guidelines for righteous living. 5. Royal Psalms that point to Christ, who is the sovereign King and deliverer of God's people. 6. Historical Psalms that recall Israel's past and highlight God's faithfulness and Israel's unfaithfulness to teach the coming generations not to repeat the mistakes of their ancestors, but to trust God and remain faithful to His covenant. The poetry of the Psalms demonstrates distinctive power to capture the attention of readers. Though some of these poetic devices are lost in translation, we can still, in our native language, appreciate many of them. 1. Parallelism involves the combining of symmetrically constructed words, phrases or thoughts. Parallelism helps in understanding the meaning of corresponding parts. For instance, in Psalm 103 verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. In this parallelism, my soul is all that is within me, namely, one's whole being. 2. Imagery uses figurative language to strongly appeal to readers' physical senses. For instance, God's refuge is depicted as the shadow of his wings in Psalm 17 and verse 8. And it reads, Keep me as the apple of your eye, hide me under the shadow of your wings. And 3. Merism expresses totality by a pair of contrasting parts, as in Psalm 88 verse 1, I have cried day and night before thee, denotes the crying without ceasing. And four, word plays employ the sound of words to make a pun and highlight a spiritual message. In Psalm 96 verses 4 and 5, the Hebrew words Elohim, gods, and Elilim, idols, create a word play to convey the message that the gods of the nations only appear to be Elohim, gods, but are merely Elilim, idols. Uh, let's read that in Psalm 96 verses 4 and 5. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Finally, the word selah denotes a brief interlude, either for a call to pause and reflect on the message of a particular section of the psalm, or a change of musical accompaniment, as you read in Psalm 61 verse 4, I will abide in your tabernacle forever, I will trust in the shelter of your wings, Selah. Wednesday, January 3, Inspired Prayers Read 2 Samuel chapter 23 verses 1 and 2 and Romans chapter 8 verses 26 and 27. What do these texts teach us about prayer? First of all, 2 Samuel 23 beginning at verse 1. Now these are the last words of David. 
Thus says David, the son of Jesse, thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. And Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. What do these texts teach us about prayer? The Psalms are inspired prayers and praises of Israel, and so in the Psalms the voice is that of God intermingled with that of his people. The Psalms assume the dynamics of vivid interactions with God. The Psalmists address God personally as, My God, O Lord, and my King in Psalm 5 verse 2 and Psalm 84 verse 3. The Psalmists often implore God to give ear as in Psalm 5 verse 1, hear my prayer as in 39 12, look as in 25 18, answer me as in 102 verse 2, and deliver me in Psalm 6 verse 4. These are clearly the expressions of someone praying to God. The remarkable beauty and appeal of the Psalms as prayers and praises lie in the fact that the Psalms are the word of God in the form of the pious prayers and praises of believers. The Psalms thus provide God's children with moments of intimacy, such as described in Romans 8, 26 and 27, which we'll read again. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Jesus, too, quoted from the Psalms, such as in Luke 20, verses 42 and 43, when he quoted directly from Psalm 110, Verse 1. Now David himself said in the book of the Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Although some Psalms have sprung from or refer to specific historical events, and the experiences of the Psalmists themselves, as well as the experiences of Israel as a nation, The psalm's spiritual depth speaks to a variety of life situations and crosses all cultural, religious, ethnic and gender boundaries. In other words, as you read the psalms, you will find them expressing hope, praise, fear, anger, sadness and sorrow, things that people everywhere in every age, no matter their circumstances, face. They speak to us all in the language of our own experiences. And so to finish today, what should Jesus' use of the Psalms tell us about the importance that they could play in our own faith experience? Thursday, January 4, The World of the Psalms Read Psalm 16, verse 8, 44, verse 8, 46, verse 1, 47, verses 1 and 7, Psalm 57, verse 2, 62, verse 8, 82, verse 8, and 121, verse 7. What place does God occupy in the psalmist's life? Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord always before me, Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. And Psalm 44 and verse 8. In God we boast all day long and praise your name forever. Selah. And 46 verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And 47 verse 1. 
O clap your hands, all ye people, shout to God with the voice of triumph. And verse 7, For God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. And 57 verse 2, I will cry out to God most high, to God who performs all things for me. And 62 verse 8, Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Psalm 82 verse 8, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. And then 121 verse 7. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The world of the Psalms is wholly God-centered. It seeks to submit, in prayer and praise, all life experiences to God. God is the sovereign creator, the king and judge of all the earth. He provides all things for his children. Therefore, he is to be trusted at all times. Even the enemies of God's people ask, Where is your God? When God's people seem to be failing in Psalm 42 verse 10, just as the Lord is the ever-present and never-failing God of his people, so God's people have God always before them. Ultimately, the Psalms envision the time when all peoples and the entire creation will worship God. As we read in Psalm 47 verse 1, O clap your hands, all ye people, shout to God with the voice of triumph. And Psalm 64 and verse 9, All men shall fear and shall declare the work of God, for they shall wisely consider his doing. The centrality of God in life produces the centrality of worship. The worship in which the Psalms lived was fundamentally different from worship as understood by many people today, because worship in the biblical culture was the natural and undisputed center of the entire community's life. Therefore, Everything that happened, both the good and the bad, in the life of God's people, inevitably was expressed in worship. God hears the psalmist wherever he may be, and responds to him in his perfect time. As you read in Psalm 3 and verse 4, I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill, Selah. And Psalm 18 and verse 6. In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him even to his ears. And Psalm 20 verse 6. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand hand. The psalmist is aware that God's dwelling place is in heaven, but at the same time, God dwells in Zion, in the sanctuary among his people. God is at the same time far and near, everywhere, and in his temple. As we read in Psalm 11, verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. Hidden in Psalm 10, verse 1, Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? And disclosed in Psalm 41, And verse 12, As for me, you uphold me in my integrity and set me before your face forever. In the Psalms, these apparently mutually exclusive characteristics of God are brought together. The Psalmists understand that proximity and remoteness were inseparable within the true being of God. As we read in Psalm 24, verses 7 to 10, Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up 
you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Salah. The psalmists understood the dynamics of this spiritual tension. Their awareness of God's goodness and presence amid whatever they were experiencing is what strengthens their hope while they wait for God to intervene, however and whenever he chooses to do so. And so to finish the day, how can the Psalms help us understand that we cannot limit God to certain aspects of our existence only? What might be parts of your life in which you are seeking to keep the Lord at a distance? Friday, January 5. The Book of Psalms consists of 150 psalms which are grouped into five books – Book 1 is Psalms 1 to 41, Book 2, 42 to 72, Book 3, Psalm 73 to 89, Book 4, Psalm 90 to 106, and Book 5, Psalm 107 to 150. The five-book division of the Psalter is an early Jewish tradition that parallels the five-book division of the Pentateuch. The Book of Psalms provides evidence of some already existing collections of psalms. The Korahite collection, Psalm 42 to 49 and 84, 85, 87 and 88. The Asaphite collection, Psalm 73 to 83. The Songs of the Ascents, Psalms 120 to 134. And the Hallelujah Psalms, 111 to 118 and 146 to 150. Psalm 72 verse 20 bears witness to a smaller collection of David's psalms. While most psalms are associated with the time of King David and early monarchy, 10th century BC, the collection of psalms continued to grow through the following centuries. The divided monarchy, the exile and the post-exilic period. It is conceivable that the Hebrew scribes under the leadership of Ezra combined the existing smaller collection of psalms into one book when they worked on establishing the services of the new temple. The fact that scribes consolidated the book of psalms does not take away from their divine inspiration. The scribes, like the psalmists, were devoted servants of God, and their work was directed by God. As you read in Ezra chapter 7 and verse 6, this Ezra came up from Babylon, and he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. The king granted him all his request, according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. And verse 10, for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. The divine human nature of the Psalms is comparable to the union of the divine and the human in the incarnated Lord Jesus. We read in the Great Controversy, page 8, But the Bible, with its God-given truths expressed in the language of men, presents a union of the divine and the human. Such a union exists in the nature of Christ, who was the Son of God and the Son of Man. Thus it is true of the Bible, as it was of Christ, that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, what does it mean that the Psalms are divine human prayers and hymns? How does this idea, however difficult to fully grasp, help us see the closeness that God wants with his people? How does it reveal in its own way how close to humanity and to each of us God is? And discussion question number two. In class, talk about a time in which you found something in the psalm speaking directly to your own situation. What comfort and hope did you find there? (music) 
And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Finding Jesus in a Holy Book by Andrew McChesney Paul went from home to home to meet people in a European city. With him he carried a Bible and the holy book of another major world religion. One day a man opened the door. His breath smelled of cigarette smoke. I would very much like to give you a gift today, Paul said. What kind of a gift? the man asked. I have this Bible, Paul said. I don't want a Bible, the man said. I belong to another religion. You're a Christian. I have the holy book of your religion too, Paul said. The man was surprised. He seemed interested. Okay, read something to me, but only from my holy book, not from the Bible, he said. Paul opened the holy book and read about Jesus. The man's surprise grew. Is this the same Jesus as in the Bible, he asked. Over the next few weeks, he studied four lessons about Jesus from his holy book. The man saw that the book does not talk about Jesus being crucified. He saw that the book predicts Jesus will come again. He saw that both people from his religion and Christians were waiting for Jesus to return. When Paul arrived for the fifth lesson, the man wasn't home. A year passed and one Sabbath, the man showed up at Paul's church. I want to come to this church, he said. Can I? It was Paul's turn to be surprised. I want to follow Christ, the man said. After that, the man came every Sabbath. He said his holy book left him feeling empty. It offered no saviour for his sins, and he longed to be baptised. Jesus says the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, Paul said. Do you want to be free from cigarettes? Jesus said, If the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed, as quoted in John 8.36 in the New King James Version. You have to choose Jesus or cigarettes. You can throw away your cigarettes today if you choose. The man looked scared. It isn't possible, he blurted out. But then he reached into his pocket and threw a cigarette packet into a trash can. Jesus, give me victory over cigarettes, he prayed. I want to be free. Late that night, he called Paul. This is terrible, he said. I feel awful. I cannot live without cigarettes. The two men prayed together on the phone. God heard the prayer and gave the man victory. He has not smoked in the four and a half years since then. Today, he is an outreach leader for the church. He loves people, Paul told Adventist Mission. He is waiting eagerly for Jesus to return. Thank you for your support of Adventist Mission, whose global mission centres help train people to share the good news of salvation with precious people from other world religions. For more information, you can visit globalmissioncenters.org.